Hey everyone, so I hope with this lecture to kind of go through some basic definitions that you'll all probably know for PK and PD. Um, I have a few kind of examples just to show that if you do know the knowledge behind your drug and how it affects the body, you really can utilize um, and optimize certain regimens for patients. And then the, at the end of the lecture, what we're going to get into is a little bit about renal dosing. I know some people are a little hesitant about renal dosing and it varies from institution to institution. I have my own philosophy that will be a little bit different, but hopefully give you all an alternative view on things. So why should PK PD matter to you? So first off, if the drug doesn't get to the site of infection at an adequate concentration for an appropriate amount of time, you're not going to treat the infection. A lot of this you're probably going to see more at the VA. If a patient that has an A1C that's 10, that has peripheral vascular disease, and has a DFI, your drug's probably not getting there for what it is, if you want to think about it that way. Um, all non-ID physicians are going to look to you for these answers. And you're not always going to have a pharmacist, especially an ID pharmacist that really knows these concepts. Well, if you're at a teaching institution, you do have the luxury of having some ID pharmacist that will know the background of this. If you do, do go into the community setting or any other types of settings, you will not potentially have this benefit. So what I like to start out with is kind of a famous article from 2002. So it's called the 90-60 rule. So about 90% of the infections treated with a susceptible drug respond. Whereas 60% of the infections treated with a resistant drug respond. <laughs> and that doesn't really make much sense, but think about it. How many times have you been consulted on an ESBL pyelonephritis, the patient's on ceftriaxone, they're afebrile, they're hemodynamically stable? It just is what happens to happen. A lot of that comes down to, sorry, a lot of that comes down to, you know, heterogeneous populations. So you'll have some ESBL maybe populations and some of their non ESBL populations. Or if you have a pseudomonas, it's not always going to be maybe beta lactam sensitive. There'll be some other heterogeneous populations with this. So our optimization of therapy, we have a chance to improve the absolute good by about 30%. So this all comes down to this wonderful triangle between drug, host, and bacteria. And within that, you have kind of three different categories you have toxicity with pharmacokinetics. You have infection with the host defenses, and you have the pharmacodynamics with resistance. So let's first jump into the pharmacokinetic part, which is really what the body does to the drug. So the first thing we're going to talk about is absorption. So we know that IV is rapid and complete. We give that it's 100% absorbed. There's no issues with GI absorption. So if your patient may have, you know, some ischemia, there's no worrying about the oral absorption of that. And then we do have IV to PO conversions for high uh, for high bioavailability drugs. And some of those that are listed are right here that you're super familiar with. But the biggest thing to take away from this is that just because it has a high degree of bioavailability does not equate to systemic concentrations. So I can give you oral amoxicillin and you absorb it very, very well. But does it get into the bloodstream? No, we typically aren't going to use that for bloodstream. We can. It may be higher doses that are outside the package insert. But for the most part, um, it really does not equate to those systemic concentrations. So when you do um, IV to PO for Bactrim, we do know that it gets good systemic concentrations, but when you do something like doxy, we know that that really likes to go to the skin and figure out a drug for a bloodstream infection. The next category is the distribution. So it's highly dependent on what drug class that you have. Um, it's really going to come down to tissue penetration versus uh, where it stays out. So to look at this, there's a one compartment versus two compartment models. So one compartment may be used for drugs which like rapidly equivalent into the tissue. So when you give an aminoglycoside, it really doesn't go anywhere else in the body. It gets into your bloodstream, goes straight into your renal system, is excreted. There's none of this distribution to the tissues, and then it may go to other parts of the body. On the other side of that, you have two compartment model, which is something like vancomycin. You'll notice that your patients, uh, especially more obese patients, you'll give vancomycin. You may see that first level come back. It may be a little bit low. Two days later, all of a sudden that level jump, triples, quadruples. That's because of that equilibrium that it gets once it gets into the tissues, and then it equates back into the blood. We sometimes refer to it as spilling back into the blood. So this all comes down to your volume of distribution. So you can see the different categories from five liters, which is blood only, up to greater than 40 liters, which is going to be your blood, your intracellular fluid, plus your intracellular fluid. So drugs that have a low volume of distribution are going to be more tight to stay within your blood system, while drugs with a high volume of distribution are going to be more to go to that extracellular space. Next, there are things that do influence both from the patient and the drug side. So patient factors is going to be tissue perfusion, uh, protein binding, so like an albumin level, for example. Um, do they have any particular disease states like I was referring to earlier, like peripheral vascular disease, CAD, whether your drug may not get there with such a high concentration? And then for your drug factors, um, the charge of the drug, of it, whether it's lipophilic versus uh, hydrophilic, um, it's free fraction. And then uh, honestly, it's molecular weight. A lot of that would depend on for blood vein barrier penetration. 
The next concept is going to be metabolism. Um, so we know that some are um, hepatically metabolized. Um, there's really data, uh, data lacking for those dosing adjustments. Actually, if you look at one like metronidazole actually has a child PC score dose recommendation. None of us use it at all, but this is one small example. But this is mainly our source of some of our drug drug interactions, what we're really going to get into. So your CYP3A4 drugs, but no, so your, you know, those are your, you know, your boriconazole or anything in your azoles that have that metabolism. The last is going to be excretion. So we know that the majority of our antimicrobials are all going to be renally excreted. So factors to consider are, um, do they have an AKI, um, a PKD? This is a potential ARC patient. So one of your younger trauma patients or your, one of your burn patients here at TGH. Uh, severity of the infection and then timing of the AKI, which we'll really get into later on. So for our pharmacodynamic concept, it splits up into two types. So we have concentration dependent killing and time dependent killing. So concentration dependent killing is very straightforward. As the concentration increases, the extent of bacterial killing increases. So the goal of this is to maximize the concentration of the drug exposure. Now time dependent is going to be the longer the duration of exposure, the greater your antibacterial activity is. So the goal of this is going to be to optimize your duration of exposure. So to see those actually on a graph, um, here you have concentration on, the, um, on your y-axis and on your x-axis you have time and hours. This would be something like an imaginary MIC. So for one potential concept that we have that we break things down into is C-max over C-min. So this is going to be where you want to maximize your concentration. An example of this is going to be your aminoglycosides. You know, the once daily, give a large big dose one time, let it go all the way out, then potentially reduce it the next day. A lot of the times we're using that as an add-on in sepsis. Our next is going to be our free time over MIC. So these are going to be your beta lactams. So it doesn't matter how much drug you give, as long as you give it a high enough percentage that's over that MIC for a significant period of time. Uh, penicillins are going to be 30 to 40 percent of the MIC. Carbapenems are going to be 60 to 70 percent. So it really matters on what your drug class is. So it's not straight across the board for all beta lactams. And last but not least is the more confusing one, which is your AUC by MIC. This is kind of a hybrid between the two. So you need your area of concentration greater than your MIC. This has really come down to play mostly with vancomycin as of late, because we still don't know how to dose it after 60 years. So we're trying something new. Um, it'll probably change in another five or 10 years. But to give you an overall aspect, um, these are kind of the main antibiotics that fall within these classes. So if you think about daptomycin as well for enterococcus, you know, we moved away from that six to eight mg per kg dose up to the 10 to 12. And that really emphasizes that Cmax um, and AUC dosing for what it needs to be. Uh, quinolones are the exact same way. Uh, but the one that we're all most more common with is beta lactams. So it was kind of referring to earlier. I'm sorry, penicillins are 40 to 50 percent over time over MIC. Cephalosporins require a significant little bit longer period of time, and then carbapenems are 30 to 40 percent. So if we take this concept that we know and we put it into a population focused application. We know that there's a high cost in increasing resistance to anti pseudo beta lactams. So, what's the proposed solution for that? Well, we want to think about maybe extended infusion dosing policies, but why would that make sense? So, the rationale for that is we know that our beta lactams, our time over MIC, um, correlates with better bacterial eradication. There's no advantage to giving four grams of miropenem versus two grams of miropenem for the actual dose it needs to be, just as long as we know that those concentrations of miropenem is going to be over that MIC longer. Um, it doesn't have a gram negative bacilli, uh, a gram negative rod post antibiotic effect. So, when you actually give it amino glycoside, um, once you hit that high peak and it goes and it drops down below the MIC, there's actually about a four to six hour period of time that actually is actively killing um, the, uh, the bacteria that beta lactams don't actually have. Um, short half lives. Do you notice a lot of your beta lactams, many are Q8 dosing to Q6 dosing? And then most common adverse effects are really unrelated to consistent serum or tissue concentrations. It's more too much significant wise. So to play that out, when you have repeated dosing, this is really the illustration that comes out. You have a, a peak, a peak, and you can see as you continue along, your peaks gradually get extensively a little bit higher. But the big thing you notice about is that your troughs on the lower side of this gets higher to where it sticks over the MIC. So the more repeated dosing you get, the higher your troughs are going to be. So how does that correlate into efficacy and, um, and outcomes? Well, this is kind of the latest meta-analysis looking at uh, zosin and carbapenems. And you can see the group that was given the extended or the continuous infusion 
all had better outcomes when compared to the short-term group and also saved money and also saved time as far as like utilization from the IV side from the hospital. So you kind of get a trifecta of effects um, that go along with this in which there's no difference in, uh, there's a difference in cost, you have a little bit better efficacy and also helps out the hospital overall. But thinking about this concept, repeated dosing really doesn't make sense in every scenario. So for beta-lactams, of course, this is the outcome we want, but when we give an aminoglycoside, we really want, or daptomycin, we really want that peak to be utilized because we know that if we continually give it over and over time, its toxicities are associated with troughs. So if we were to give an aminoglycoside repeatedly over and over, we're increasing that risk of the nephrotoxicity, the ototoxicity, and other associated adverse effects. So that really gets into why aminoglycosides correlate better with the once daily regimen. So they have concentration dependent killing, which we talked about. They have that post antibiotic effect that they were talking about earlier. So even after you give that the one hour infusion, it stays around for that four to six hours. It's even documented up to eight hours of actually getting that bacterial killing effect. Um, it's often used in combination with the cell wall agent because we know the cell wall agent, like a beta lactam, will target the PBPs, potentially letting aminoglycosides um, penetrate further within. And then, as we mentioned, its TOF concentrations are really associated with that nephrotoxicity. So we know that the probability of toxicity is a cumulative effect that we were describing earlier. So the more and more you, the more and more you give it with the cumulative AUC, the higher probability is of that toxicity, where if you give it with that one daily group, you can see that you have a significant decrease in that overall. Um, so there is one caveat though, two aminoglycosides. So VA is a 27 year old male with cystic fibrosis. A VAL is performed that is growing uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The patient is clinically infected and is already on max dose meropenem. Which aminoglycoside do you choose and why? So we have amikacin that's susceptible at 8, MIC of 8. Um, we have tobramycin susceptible to MIC of 2, and gentamicin susceptible to MIC of 4. So do we know, is anybody aware of kind of maybe the CMAX target that we want to do, a CMAX MIC target that we want to have with aminoglycosides? So that's actually something that comes into effect. So ideally in this scenario, you'd want to use tobramycin. It's not because, it's kind of because within this class, so overall, um, if people always tell you, you know, don't trust the, MI, the lower MIC is not always the right answer. Well, with aminoglycosides is a little bit different because we're actually trying to attempt to hit a peak ratio of at least 10 to 1. So if you go back to look at your susceptibilities, a 10 to 1 ratio with amicacin, we're trying to hit a peak of 80. That's a very high peak from an overall standpoint. With gentamicin, we'd be trying to hit a peak of 40. And then with tobramycin, trying to hit a peak of 20. And then as also, as we know, which I believe you all previously discussed a little bit of, MICs can vary by a half dilutional ratio. So that amicacin and MIC could technically be one dilution higher. So we could actually be needing to get even higher than that. Same for tobramycin, same for gentamicin. So the, it's not necessarily the efficacy of the drug, but rather avoiding the toxicity. Yeah, avoiding the toxicity. And can I reach that efficacy point? Can I get that peak like, that I need? Can you ever get to that? Yeah, point? can I ever get to I that point? Because I could give amicacin, and I'm sure I could probably get a peak. I mean, I've we've, I've seen a peak in that high before, but knowing the risk of toxicity that will come along with that because of how much we say in the body, this really doesn't what that benefit when you can give tobramycin in this case. Do we know at one point of the peak we start to see toxicities? So it's a trough base. So the issue with giving such a massive peak dose is that we know it's going to stay around longer, and it's not going to give you any better um, killing effect the higher you peak you get. So if it was an amicacin, we ignore it, the susceptibility in this case, but if it was an amicacin level of 80 and 100, you'd still be getting the same killing effect overall from a standpoint. You just have a massive amount more concentration in the body, which would likely lead to do a cumulative effect on the back end of that. So we would have to give probably an amicacin dose of somewhere in the 1500 to 2 gram range. When Tobra in this case, if it's a you know 70 kg patient, normal renal function, you know, normal height, you'll probably give like a dose of 400. So it's significantly less dose in order to hit that peak. The danger is the trough will be much. Yeah, the trough will be dose. much higher up. Yeah, but then it's dose. Yeah, and so it'll hang around for a whole lot. Exactly. This is just kind of going right back through those scenarios again of what needs to be. So how do we optimize drug dose and selection? So for drugs that are C-max and C-mid, bigger dose. So the easiest example is adaptomycin with enterococcus. Normal FDA approved dose is six mg per kg. 
we know from PKPD studies that it has a lot better killing effect the higher dose we give. So now it's, you know, 10 mg per kg to 12 mg per kg dosing recommendation. Um, time over MIC, give the dose more frequently. Um, you can do it more frequently or you can do it continuously, works as well. Um, in some cases, you actually just have to administer a different drug. You just can't get drug in that area that's going to be over there. And sometimes you also need to switch to a more potent agent. An actual visualization of this, which kind of helps out, is so the flat uh, blank black line is your control line. And then as you see here on the sides, as you look at the different variations, there's a fourth of the MIC target, one times the MIC, four times the MIC, and then the dot separated apart is 16 the MIC. So the easiest one to start out with is beta lactams. So it doesn't matter the greater the MIC that you have. So the greater amount of concentration I'm getting to get over that MIC, it's actual bacterial load is getting less and less. But as long as even but if you see it a fourth times the MIC for a longer concentration period of time, it, it achieves that actual killing effect overall. But the opposite can be said kind of when we get towards the aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones, we'll see that the higher the MIC is better for their for their kinetics for what needs to be expressed at this point in times. A few patient cases to kind of put everything in perspective. Um, 60 year old male admitted to the MIC diagnosed with Pseudomonas VAP. Um, they're 70 kg, have a renal clearance of 60 ml per minute. Um, these are the sensitivities that you get back. Um, we know that if you go to the package insert or go to uh, Micromedics with um, Mirapidum, um, it's Cmax is going to be 100 micrograms per milliliter. Um, it's half-life is going to be one hour. It's going to have a dosing interval of every eight hours. And we know earlier our target attainment for carbapenems needs to be 30 to 40 percent above that target attainment. So if you look at CLSI for Pseudomonas, their breakpoints are susceptible is less than or equal to two for intermediates four and resistant is greater than eight. Well, this is based on a one gram Q8 over 30 minute infusion of mirapenem. So that's your most basic package insert level um, grading. So this is the MIC that you came back yet. So what we're do trying to do right now is target an MIC of four. If we're able to go look at Monte Carlo simulations of studies, we can determine that potentially based on uh, like epidemiology of pseudomonas and mirapenem MICs, what we can actually do with extending the infusion. So this is the normal distribution of pseudomonas MICs to mirapenem. So as, you, as the MIC increases, you can see the probability of target attainment, just the distribution of those is going to be lower and lower. So if we start with a half hour infusion of two grams at this point in time, at a MIC, we can just say this is you know, less than or 0.25. We have 100% of probability of target attainment. As the further your MIC gets, the less and less your chance is of achieve, achieving that. So ideally, we want to have at least a 90% probability of target attainment when actually going for this. So as you see, as we move to a three hour infusion, we're really having a target, an MIC of four. We easily hit that right here once we extend all the way out of this period of time. So this is probably an MIC, just looking at the chart below, we can say somewhere around eight. So we're easily able to achieve that. Now, does that necessarily mean we're going to achieve that in the patient's body? You know, in this case, it's a, you know, normal weight size patient with a decreased renal function. So you're likely to achieve that. Well, let's say you have a you know patient has a BMI of 40 um, there, and, and you know, we'll say they're a trauma-related patient, so they have a hyperacute, you know, we'll call it ARC is what they associate it with. You may not be able to get this target attainment. So there's a lot of other factors that correlate in, but in your normal typical patient, you're, you can actually maximize your dosing and hit scenarios like this. So for a visual standpoint, a half hour infusion gets a Cmax of around 100. So your time over MIC is around four and a half hours for a two gram half hour infusion. So you get, if you actually end up doing a three hour infusion, your Cmax gets way less than that. It gets around 40, but your time over MIC is around six and a half hours. So you get that extra two hours of time over MIC for that period of time. So then we know that we're more likely to hit that target attainment within this patient. And we know that we don't care about Cmax from our visualization earlier. As this, you know, as your time, as your multiplicate, multiplicative over your MIC for the beta-lactams, you can see you had a deep, like less bacterial killing or not any improvement in that. Another one of these. Previous patients say if you wanted to try to get around the problem that you had, you would dose them still the one gram at the same interval, but just make the infusion longer. So say that again. I'm sorry. So in the in the same kind of you yeah. get past the whole the whole um, the resistance profile by increasing your time over mech. Um, basically, you would do the same dose, same intervals, just a longer infusion. You could even increase the dose at that point. So even though even though by like doing one gram versus two gram, you might get a 
even though it doesn't matter the CMAX that we get, it could it giving it higher concentration may allow it to time over the MIT longer. So if you were to give, you know, a one gram right here, you may only get to say a C max of 10. And so you're going to fall below that MIC quicker. So just by giving that two grams, you might. So we can say just for, extend yeah, that. extend that, but when it seemed to be longer. So if you were to give one gram in this case, you could take these two on the chart and move them down slightly. Yeah. So it's not like it totally does not matter as far as um, the end result, but for actual killing and bacterial decrease, it, the giving more more drug or overall drug for valactin is not going to offer any benefit. Then why don't we just do all like extended fusions? Um, it's always a great question. So a lot of it has to come down to um, just nursing staff in general. So line, so line's going to be taken up. At Moffitt, you know, all your patients have a port or pick line, probably double, triple lumen. So we have the ability to, to be able to probably do that for all of our drugs. We've only been able to do Zosin. For that aspect, I think TGH, y'all do Zosin as well. What? Extended extended infusion. I don't think we extend any. Oh, it's not across the board. No. Well, we can order it. We can order it. So at Moffitt, it's across the board. So at Moffitt, if you order Zosin, it's automatically 3.375 Q8 extended over three hours. That from was prior to me getting there. I do know from my previous institution when trying to implement that, there's always some pushback because of line availability. Um, but in general, is it best to start all your patients on that? Yeah, I would if I could. I would have every patient with them. You know, if I'm giving cefepime, you give two grams up front, then you do two grams Q8 infusion for three hours and you'd be optimizing all your beta lactams. Um, this is going to be a little bit different kind of uh, population post application. So this is taking into effect, you knowing your PKPD and then also the resistance of your organism. So problem here is high cost and broad spectrum therapy of mild to moderate um, enterococcus urinary tract infections. A lot of the times I always have ASB in here because they're not real. Um, there's so a uh, proposed solution that we had at my previous institution that we implemented is no no routine identification or susceptibility. You just put enterococcus species in the urine and you put a micro comment encouraging amino penicillin use. A lot of you might wonder, well, what happens if it's, you know, a VRE when it's efacium and a lot of the times it's amp resistant. So if you take your um, bench, your PK and all that, if you have your bank resistant enterococcus faecalis and your bank resistant efacium, you can see right here. Um, your MICs that normally these correlate to. And these are for your amino penicillins. Um, they end up having extremely high MICs, even most of the time with facium, probably upwards in the 256 range. So how in this case can you actually utilize um, an um, antibiotic in this case that's going to be resistant? Well, you need to get something. Well, we need to get something that gets above 256. So how are we going to know if our drug actually gets the concentration higher than that? So you can actually see outcomes, or you can actually see um, in this case, um, where if you potentially give something like um, ampicillin or amoxicillin, and you know how they're ring excreted, or how they're absorbed, distributed, and excreted, that you might be able to get that. So because amino penicillin, so ampicillin and amoxicillin, um, get renally extruded so well, you actually can achieve greater than 500 your MIC within your urine. So for pylo and for cystitis, you can, when you give oral amoxicillin, you're, it's getting tremendously concentrated there well. So knowing that your enterococcus um, resistance mechanisms for both facalis and facium are really high level expression of PPP5. So it's just a low affinity binding PPP. It's not like it's an ESBL that's actively producing a, um, an enzyme that's degrading your drug. It's just really just having less affinity overall. So all you have to do to overcome that is give a whole lot more drug. So in this case, um, by uh, giving your amino penicillin and having so well concentrations, you're able to actually get that in the urine to significantly overcome all those MICs. So looking at a few studies, um, amino penicillin versus non-beta lactams, you can see that there was no statistically significant difference as far as clinical cure, 30-day um, re-emission, 30-day all-cause mortality. Um, it's all applicable across the board. And then looking at it for VRE specifically, for amino susceptible um, overall, you had 17 out of 20. For amino non-susceptible, uh, 28 out of 37. So looking at this, um, there were no non-susceptible actual F uh, ones in this case ended up having um, VRE that held off. But so looking at this, 
knowing this and seeing all this, really optimizing your drug dosing can be key for a lot of a lot of component, a lot of interventions. So if you know that you're able to optimize up front, you can prevent a lot of things down low. So some questions for you to ponder. Um, what factors influence your decision to apply alternative dosing strategies in your patients? Um, if you round at me with Moffitt, I'm definitely going to have a more aggressive dosing pattern for my beta lactams. It's just where, how and where I trained and obviously where I came from. But if you're at TGH or the VA, there's going to be some differences. Even at Moffitt, between uh, the three of us that are there, we'll all have slight differences in that. But some of this needs to be developed by you and see how we look at our patients and what we evaluate. Um, and then are there situations in which you would consider alternative dosing strategies despite system-based policies? So at Moffitt, you order Zosin, it's going to be 3.375 Q8 extended infusion is the standard set for all of our pharmacists that verify orders to go to. But is there going to be a situation where you maybe want four and a half Q8 or do you want continuous infusion Zosin? So those are some of the things that where while system-based policies are nicely in place, that sometimes you might have to realize those system-based policies and actually, you know, over Trump or trump those policies for what you need for your patient. So here we're going to transition to does one size fit all? So issues with PKPD and renal dysfunction. I like to talk about this topic because I think um, a lot of the times you probably get calls from when you put orders in or when an order's put in of, you know, what should the dose should be? Should it be renally dosed in this case? Probably if for, probably when you're a Moffitt, I know a lot of the pharmacists will just call the fellows and sometimes, you know, it's easy to just peek over and talk to us, but it, you know, further in life, you're not going to be able to just to have that luxury. So a quote that I always stick by, there was an explicitive that I left out of here, but back when I was at Henry Ford, Dr. Ramesh used to say, if a patient's dead, it doesn't matter if it's properly dose adjusted. And you really have to think about that. A, a lot of the times, you know, you'll, you'll have people be like, oh, well, what about, you know, encephalopathy with cefepime and toxicity? And, you know, the patients just, just got admitted in the first 24 hours. Like, yes, I've seen that happen. Yes, I agree that does happen. But in the first 24 hours, my patient's crashing in the ICU. Is that was going to be my first thought process? No, I'm going to want to optimize my drug to the best of my ability, despite maybe what the renal function, what they look like. So beta lactam is the standard dosing. Um, a lot of this is really derived from non-critically ill patients, um, or if the renal dose adjustments are based on patients with stable CKD. So they take, you know, the cream of the crop patients with stage three CKD, and they give them one dose of cefepime, and they assess that, hey, we should maybe do this at one gram Q12. I wonder how many of you have actually used one gram Q12 of cefepime in here. I probably would say not very many, just based upon the kind of the bill we know. But when you really break down the dosing of beta lactams, there's a huge wide individual variability in the actual PK, especially in critically ill patients. Um, I probably all hear Dr. Canella talk significantly about this, and they're going to do a little bit of this starting at the PK, but doing therapeutic drug monitoring with your beta lactams is becoming a significantly larger thing implemented at a lot of hospitals throughout the, uh, throughout the country. We do it a little bit at, um, over at Moffitt, especially if we have a patient with a higher MIC, maybe a multi-drug resistant organism, and we're sending them out for a period of time. But this is why we do it, because when you go look through all the studies, there's a multitude of studies showing you really get subtherapeutic levels, particularly in sepsis. Um, so low beta lactam concentrations, you have actual uh, one and a half fold higher risk of clinical failure, need for antibiotic escalation, uh, need for antibiotic reinitiation, or actual death. So a lot of this correlates around the first 48 hour period of this critical time. So patient comes into the ED gets evaluated by the ED, they get labs, um, they're starting to microbials, they think sepsis. So a lot of patients when they come in, they don't have, you know, ideal labs. They come in particularly, potentially in a um, in an AKI or dehydrated, you know, hypovolemic. So within the first 48 hours, um, inadequate therapy uh, resulted in increased odds of mortality, the number needed to, uh, to treat of 10. Um, for community-acquired bloodstream infections, um, adequate therapy by 40 hours demonstrated the strongest negative association for 28-day mortality of all the time intervals tested. And then if you look at a CAR, a CAR, a CAR analysis of enterococcus and staff, within 48 and 45 hours, um, you had reduced mortality respectively if you got the correct antibiotics on board for those. So you can really see the first 48 hours can be a significant period. So uh, Krast and colleagues had a great article um, in CID that are we jumping the gun when we dose these antibiotics up front for patients presenting? So when they present in sepsis with them, um, right, getting out of the ED, you know, ED direct ICU admission, um, are we actually uh, dose adjusting them when we shouldn't be? So they had a hypothesis that uh, renal impairment is actually acute rather than chronic. So in, clinic, in a clinically meaningful por uh, por por proportion of patients admitted with um, infectious diseases, 
that this impairment should resolve within 48 hours of a substantial portion of these cases. So you get a patient in, you know, they get adequately fluid resuscitated, they get started with proper care. That this is kind of, you know, a pseudo AKI that you see up front more so. So they looked at about uh, 19,000 uh, unique patient encounters uh, with varying um, cases. So the overall rate of AKI on admission was around 20%, so around one in five. Um, and then around 60% of those patients, that AK resolved actually in 45 minutes. Um, so this did vary based upon kind of among infection types, some of the care they were taking under, but it really makes you realize that, you know, if that patient comes in and you, you know, give them one gram Q24, one gram Q12 cefepime, and let's say maybe the next day you aren't exactly, you know, monitor, or they say you don't get looked at to another 24 hours later, you could be significantly underdosing them for the particular infection they have. So it's potentially their idea was, um, all standard uh, renal equations assume like a steady state condition or constant assumptions. So that we know there is a lag time between a patient's glomerulonephritis rate and their corresponding change in serum creatinine. So you may not, so they may be actually adequately, you know, renal functioning, but you may see their serum creatinine, they may be within an AKI. So the serum creatinine rate of change is actually proportional to both the degree of change in glomerulonephritis filtration and the patient's uh, baseline renal function. And that likely a lot of patients that present with a AKI within the 40, uh, 48 hours actually had a recovery of their GFR much earlier than you would assume. I know a lot of the times that we are making these dose adjustments that we're like, you know, realize, uh, utilizing the pharmacist on the team or when we're doing that, but it's something to really take into account. If you have a patient that comes in sepsis, um, you, know, you have the option of, hey, I could dose reduce them up front, or if you're going to be cognizant enough, you could give them max dosing up front, you know, see about the renal function the next day, check it the next day. When for 24 to 40 hour period, it's still worsening or not improved, then make the dose adjustment at that time. But if you think about it, to get to steady state level, we need five doses of an antibiotic. So if you wait 48 hours, you get five doses of an antibiotic, you're at steady state, you're exactly where you need to be, then you can dose adjust off that. But what really shows, um, if you break down some of our uh, recent trials with some of our actual beta, uh, newer beta lactams, so um, Ceph has avibactam and reclaimed one and two. Um, Ceph told Tezobactam in the aspect um, complicated intra abdominal trial, and then also daptomycin in the staph aureus and endocarditis study. You can see up front um, that the two newer uh, beta lact or two newer beta lactam um, inhibitors were compared to meropenem. And there was no difference between the groups. You know, we had these studies that came out showed non-significance. Um, we were doing fine. But really, once you start to break down the data within uh, the groups of the modified needed to treat and then addition to harm to treat, you really start to get some worrisome and some differences. So when you look at the reclaim study, when you actually look at the differences based upon your serum creatinine level, you kind of get uh, some astounding results. So greater than 50, you have no significant change. But when you get down to that gap of 50 to 30, I mean, there's a that's a 30% difference between your clinical outcomes in your ceftaz ivy group and your meropenem group. So you're telling me that for a simple infection with meropenem, with a patient with dose reduced, you, you would rather give that than ceftaz ivy back to him. It's essentially what this data is pointing out. Um, once again, still in the modified attention to treat analysis, still there's significant difference of around 26%. And then, then people that completed therapy, um, it goes down, it goes a little bit higher, around 16%. So what this data is showing you is that patients with decreased renal function um, that are maybe in a more significant state than what it's studied in to have where that dose is actually found out at, that this might not be the correct renal dose adjustment that should be done. Uh, but here again is septal tazobactam compared to meropenem. This is in complicated um, intra-abdominal infections. And once again, patients with reduced renal function, you see a significant difference in mortality between uh, ceftaltezo and the meropenem group. And same, uh, not as much once in the modified um, group, but the modified intention to treat group is still significantly there. And daptomycin, you can see, once again, as you have a decrease in renal function, um, you can have some of those issues that was showing up with the increased chances of failure. So while these studies are relatively small, the numbers they have, it does bring up a point that it's unclear if this is an emerging issue or one that was undetected in you know, previous drug development, because we are getting these renal dose adjustments in patients that are really clinically stable. Um, we're getting the cream of the crop um, patients for that. So just regardless, this is something that I, that I am cognizant about. If you're with me and we have a patient that requires one of these, that requires you know, Zerbax or Advocast, I will always dose what one level up 
um, just because of this data, when you can see about it, patients have decreased renal function, particularly. Um, I do try to do max dosing, at least for the first two days, if you know, the physician group and obviously the primary team are okay with that. There needs to be always, this discussion always comes up, but it's just clear once you look at the data, there is some concerns that maybe the dose adjustments that they have put out there that they recommend are not quite what's needed for some of these more severe infections. Um, so solution for all this, um, antibiotics with a wide therapeutic index. Um, so beta-lactams, you could potentially defer dose adjustments for the first 48 hours of therapy. Why? Low toxicity risk. Um, you know, going back to the example of cefepime, we know that that's one thing that's going to be a cumulative effect over time. Um, it's not going to be something where you get to your immediate steady state level. Um, is a loading dose required? Um, if you're going to go to the extended infusion, I say yes. Um, you give one up front. So if you're going to do cefepime, two grams, Q8 extended infusion, I suggest giving two grams and then starting, you know, within a few hours later, that actual regimen, just because you do need to get your concentration above the MIC to actually get it effectively going. You don't want to start slowly giving drug over time and letting it build up is one concern. And then TDM, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, I think, you know, within a five to 10 year period, that's going to be kind of a standard thing that you see across the board that we're doing, especially in some of these, especially in the ICU, um, outside of the ICU. I think, again, it'll come down to um, severity of infection or some of the protocols like that. But I think really in the ICU, we're going to start seeing therapeutic drug monitoring. And then antibiotics with a the narrow therapeutic index, so like aminoglycosides and VANC. Um, deferral, uh, deferred renal dose adjustments carries them, you know, an accepted risk of treatment related toxicities. So we know that a patient is in an AKI. If we rapidly keep giving that aminoglycoside, we could even cause call, call more nephrotoxicity or potentially ototoxicity. But really, who needs to thank you? I always, always answer. <laughs> Uh, but I hope this is enlightening to kind of give you a, you know, a taste of PKPD, probably some definitions I went through or previously know about, but then, then to give you a little bit, you know, different factors to think about. And I'm welcome to take any questions you'll have.